Hello friends! I made a comparison between the RD9 and the TR909 and that got uh, kind of popular. So uh, people started asking me for more information, like how does the groove and the sync compare between the two? And I thought that was a good and interesting question and it uh, shouldn't take too long, so let's try that. 2000 years later. Oh my Bob, this is so complicated. Every time I do measurements, I get like different results. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and every time I dig down into that and try to figure out what's going on, I find new issues and I realize I've done something weird or wrong and I have to start over. Um, I'm at the like third or fourth time now. I don't know. We'll see if this ever gets finished. This video is about one of those yak shaving things. Namely, when I test how stable the drum machines are when they are synced from MIDI, how do I know it's the drum machines and not the MIDI clock that is unstable? I need to measure the clock stability and use the most stable source I have. Now, how can I measure that? I don't have any fancy test equipment in a whole wall somewhere in my studio. Well, I do have a 96 kilohertz audio interface and that's not particularly impressive, but recording the MIDI signals to WAV files, uh, I should be able to measure things with an accuracy up to 196 millisecond one. It's hard to say, 96. That's about 10 microsecond and that's good enough. But, MIDI is plus 5 volt, and I didn't know if my audio interface could handle that, so I soldered up this thing. It's simply a passive volume control or voltage divider, whatever you want to call it. So I connected the MIDI out to the audio interface via that thing and started to record to Ableton Live because Audacity doesn't like my audio interface. And yeah, it turns out that the plus 4 decibel level of my audio interface are actually way more than 5 volts, rather like 10. So this thing was not needed at all. And in the bin it goes. Also, loads of media equipment use only 3.3 volts, which I did not know was an option, but always kind of was. Let me explain. MIDI specifies 5 volts over 220 ohms. That creates a current of 5 milliamperes, and it's that current that is important. But if you use 3.3 volts and 47 ohms, you get 23 milliamperes as well. So in theory, that should work for all MIDI equipment just as well as using 5 volts over 220 ohms. It wasn't officially supported until 2014 though, uh, but equipment from before that should work, in theory. Anyway, the audio interface doesn't measure the current, it measures the voltage, so 3.3 volt will give a lower level. And even although the level of 5 volts was rather low, it generally worked even with 3.3 volts. Until one day, I tested the 909 and I got ground loop problems. Ground loops aren't an issue for MIDI because the MIDI spec includes optical isolation on the MIDI input exactly as to not cause ground loops. But I wasn't using a MIDI interface, I was using an audio interface, so how do I solve that? Well, I could probably just have soldered up an adapter to use the fact that my audio interface is balanced. That would probably have worked, but I didn't think of that. In fact, I should probably specifically have built an optically isolated current to voltage converter or something, and I did think about that. About that. But at that point, I was thoroughly annoyed with this whole project and was looking for shortcuts. Which leads to MIDI through boxes because I thought I could maybe fix that ground loop by putting a MIDI device in between the audio input and the MIDI out. That introduces the optical isolation that is needed and gets rid of the ground hum, but it could also add its own delays and instabilities to the signal and so on. So I investigated that option. And the simplest MIDI through port can be just optical insulation of the signal and then sending out exact copies of that signal on the output via a buffer. That's cheap and easy and should not cause delays. But you could also consider recording MIDI data into a digital buffer, uh, investigating that MIDI data and then sending it out. And that would cause delays and uh, could even inst introduce instabilities in the timing. And we can't have that. 
And I have two MIDI throughs. Uh, one is a MIDI tech and one is a MIDI man. And I investigated both of, both of them and the MIDI tech has a delay. And that's absolutely no surprise because in fact it can filter signals. So it has to read them in so it can filter them. That's the reason I bought it in the first place, specifically because it can filter MIDI clocks, ironically enough. Um, the delay is 0.4 milliseconds. That's not a problem in practical day-to-day -day use, but it's a problem in this case. The MIDI man's delay is around uh, one sample, 10 microseconds. So that's just some electrical delay because I opened it up and checked and yeah indeed it's it's just an optical isolation and a hex buffer. So that was stable, wouldn't affect my measurements, so I decided the MIDI man would be excellent to get rid of the ground loop problem. But then it turns out it's not happy with 3.3 volt MIDI equipment. And two of my MIDI interfaces are indeed 3.3 volts, so I don't want to measure some things through the MIDI man and other things not. So yeah, that also did not work. So to get rid of the ground loop, I ended up putting a microphone preamp between the MIDI outputs and the audio interface. And that way I ended up balancing the signal without having to solder an adapter and therefore getting rid of the ground loop. And in addition to that, it boosts the signal. So I could now record both the 5 volt MIDI signals and the 3.3 volt MIDI signals at approximately the same level. Double whammy! The yak has been shaved. Wait, what was the purpose of me shaving that yak again? Right, right, now I'm back to the actual problem, getting consistent recordings of the equipment I have that can send MIDI clocks. And here is how the MIDI interfaces did when I sent a MIDI clock from Ableton Live. And I just realized I need to explain what this means, what's going on here. So I recorded the MIDI signal, but then I've written a Python script to uh, look at that MIDI signal and extract the times between each click. And then I do statistical analysis on it. I'm getting the standard deviation and not only the standard deviation, also the maximum deviation between the different times uh, between each MIDI clock. So that's what you're seeing here. It's the standard deviation of the time it takes between each MIDI clock. And the standard deviation here, as you can see, is around two milliseconds, which is not good at all. Yes, they all perform terribly. It's so bad that you can just see how uneven the clicks are when you're looking at the waveform. And they're all like that, all the MIDI interfaces. Now, when you mix MIDI clocks with MIDI notes, I understand that when two things are supposed to happen at once, one gets delayed, but this is all MIDI clock, nothing else. Uh, so whose fault is this? It can't be the MIDI interfaces because there are four different interfaces from three different manufacturers. It can't be the drivers because the MIU and the MIDI Sport have different drivers and the MIDI Link MIDI and MIDI Phase are class compliant, use the standard Windows drivers. So it could be Ableton Live. It could also be just that Windows sucks. I can test if it's Windows fault by using another operating system. I don't currently have a Mac, which would be a good test because that's the operating system that dominates the music market. But I do use Linux. Can I find software that will send a MIDI clock from my Linux computer? Short answer, no. Long answer, also no. But I could write my own little Python script using a MIDI library called Mido. That library can use several different backends, and after hours of trying, I managed to get Pygame to work both on Linux and on Windows. And I also had to find a MIDI interface that worked on both computers because the MIDITEC MIDI link for some reason behaved strangely and didn't actually send anything out when connected to my Linux laptop. However, the MIDITEC MIDI face 16 by 16 worked perfectly, so I used that one. And on Linux, the standard deviation was 39 microseconds, while on Windows it was 815 microseconds. So it's 20 times worse on Windows. And why would that be? Well, it could be Python's fault. I wrote little timing test scripts that didn't use any MIDI at all, so I could run it on both Linux and Windows and also 
ask the Mac users at work to run it as well. And on Linux, when I ask the processor to sleep for a microsecond, it actually sleeps around 60 microseconds on average. On OS X, it was 74 microseconds, same sort of ballpark. But on my Windows PC, when I ask it to sleep a microsecond, it sleeps between one and two milliseconds, 1000 times more than I asked it to. But then I ran the script on my work Windows machine as well, and there I got completely different results. There it slept 36 microseconds on average. That was the best yet. So Python is involved in this somehow? Well, it turns out Python 3.11 uses a new high resolution clock in Windows that only exists since Windows 8. So using Python 3.11 give much better results on Windows than Python 3.10. But on Linux and OS X, they used the high resolution clock the whole time since those operating systems had had such high resolution clocks for much longer. So it's not specifically Windows fault, it's the fault of having to support Windows 7 or earlier that doesn't have that high resolution clock. And Ableton Live 9, which I'm using, indeed supports Windows 7. So uh, apparently a millisecond or two is as accurate as Windows 7 gets, which makes my result of 0.8 milliseconds of standard deviation completely understandable. And it explains why the clock signal from Ableton Live has a two millisecond standard deviation as well. And it really explains why professional studios use Macs. Sure, Microsoft fixed this issue in Windows 8 and gave developers a more high resolution clock, but that took a few years for developers to support it, like Python didn't until October 2022. Ableton Live 11 and 12 require Windows 10 or later. It's possible they have accurate MIDI clock signals, but I'm not going to pay for the upgrade just to test that. And if it does, it still didn't support it until 2021. And that's way too late for Windows to get a foothold on the audio market. So there's a reason Mac won. And a similar thing happened with iOS versus Android. Okay, I shaved that yak. What was I doing again? Right, finding a good clock source. So Ableton Live 9 on Windows is definitely not an option. Let's look at what hardware I have that might be useful as a MIDI clock source. What the heck? Why is the RY30 so bad? The Yamaha RY30 drum machine is almost as bad as Ableton on Windows 7, but it's a real-time device with a decent microprocessor. It should be better than the older things like the 909 or the Yamaha RX17. So I decided to look at the waveform and we see here that some messages are way off and they look a little bit different. There are no note on or off messages, nothing is playing. So what could it be? There's another MIDI standard for synchronization. It's called MIDI timecode. It doesn't send clocks, it sends times or rather frames and subframes where frames refer to frames in a film like 24, 25 or 30 frames per second. Yes, like your video game. This is because the common standard to sync things is called SMPTE for Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. And it uses the frame rate of film and TV to sync things. So MTC isn't to sync instruments, but to sync time-based things like cameras and tape recorders. With MTC, you can record SMPTE sync to your tape recorder and your sequences and drum machine will not get a clock tick. Instead, it will get told what time it is in frames and subframes. And that means when you sync, you can start in the middle of the song instead of it's at the start. Oh shit! What if that's why Ableton did so bad? It sends MIDI time code. Did I shave that whole why Windows sucks jack for no reason? No, it's fine. Ableton just sends the MIDI clock or rather in Ableton, you can choose if you want to send MTC or MIDI clock, but the Yamaha RY30 always sends both and I can't find a way to change that. So I spend a lot of time editing out the MTC signals from the test file to check and the RY30 still didn't impress. So I'm not using that one. And MIDI timecode didn't ever get very popular because it's designed to sync physical hardware and didn't come around until 1989. 10 years later, everybody had switched to DAWs anyway. In addition to that, there's another way of syncing where you are in a song that enables you to start in the middle of the song. It's called Song Position Pointer. I don't know when it became a part of the MIDI specification. It might have been a part of the original one. I do know my Roland MC50 sequencer uses it. 
Oh shit, I forgot about the MC50. How accurate is that one? Hang on, I gotta test. A few moments later. Yeah, it will also send extra codes. If it's MTC or song position pointer, it's unclear. But instead of editing those out by hand, which was insanely boring, I added some code to my test script to filter them out. But even with that filter, both the RY30 and the MC50 does not impress. And besides, these extra MIDI signals might confuse the old processor in my 909. So it's better if I use a source that only sends MIDI clock. So we're going to ignore the RY30 and the MC50. And now we're back on track again. How does the equipment that doesn't send MTC or SPP do? Well, worst of the bunch is my Nord Modular with 107 microseconds of standard deviation between MIDI clock ticks. Not very impressive, but then again, who would use a Nord Modular as a MIDI clock source? My Arturia Keystep fares a lot better with just 37 microseconds of standard deviation, narrowly beating the Linux. And a Yamaha RX-17 with 21 microseconds is in the same ballpark, but slightly better. But there are winners, and they are two. And that's the Behringer RD6 and the Behringer TD3. Both of them have MIDI clock signals that consistently are sent within 50 microseconds, with a standard deviation of approximately 5 microseconds, which is very impressive. And it's no surprise it's modern machines with modern microcontrollers. Although I have to say I'm surprised to beat the key step. I'm going to use the TD6 as the clock source for the MIDI test of the 909 and the Behringer TD9. It took me one and a half years to get this far, so don't expect any miracles when it comes to the next video. Uh, I do think I really have ironed most problems now, but I started this uh, YouTube channel because I had uh, time left over during lockdown. And there's no more lockdown and no more time. And I'm doing it because it's fun. And this has been really frustrating and maybe not so much fun. So unless this video gets a lot of uh, likes, maybe subscribes even, and comments telling me you really need that other video with the RD9 and 909 comparing the sync and stuff like that. Um, I might not do it. Um, I think I've gotten everything ironed out. I think I can do it now, but it's gonna take time. And if nobody is actually interested, I'm not going to do it. So uh, yeah, like and subscribe, not because of the uh, algorithm and not because I want to uh, go viral, but just to give me some sort of inspiration and uh, some sort of motivation of finishing this stuff. All right, see you next time.